All right. Welcome, everyone. Hello, hello. So glad to see everyone today. Uh, we're glad to be with you and we welcome you and thank you for joining us for another Brunch and Learn brought to you by The Qualified. My name is Chapara Denson and I will be serving as your host for today. So just a little bit about our Brunch and Learns. Our Brunch and Learns are events that are not only designed to provide you with outstanding continuing education opportunities for those who are a HEMA credentialed. We also want to create a space for you to connect with your peers and to meet some new colleagues. So please feel free, those joining us live, please feel free to post in the chat if you are open to connecting with some of your colleagues, maybe on LinkedIn. Just kind of start um, acting, working out our chat feature here, okay? Uh, we also encourage your participation throughout the presentation. So you are welcome to add comments. You're welcome to post your questions. And we will be monitoring the chat and posing your questions to our presenter toward the end of our time together today. So I do wanna share a little bit about the qualified. For those who are not aware, the qualified is here to serve you in a variety of ways. We provide continuing education opportunities, much like this Brunch and Learn that um, you are attending today. We also provide tutoring services, online courses, certification exam preparation, we can help out with job placement. We can help out with recruitment and so much more. So please do check out our website for more information. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to go ahead and move us on to today's presentation because I'm super, super excited about it. I think it's going to be great. Today's presentation is going to pull us out of our boxes a little. So for the next hour, we're going to move around and get our minds going and even get our bodies moving as well. So without any further ado, I am now going to turn it over to our speaker of the hour, Miss Julia Meyer of Bell Blossom. Julia, it's into your hands. Thank you so much, Dupera. Welcome, TQ community. Stoked to be uh, in front of the camera today. Let's see the next slide, please. So I'm Julia Meyer. I am one half of Stay Qualified here at The Qualified, where we help our uh, community keep their certifications fresh and their knowledge relevant. And today we're actually going to talk about something that is super important to me because when I'm not serving TQ, I work with very anxious students as a certification testing coordinator for our local college, serving hundreds of them per year. And a number of years ago, I decided that I really needed an opportunity to stop taking an anxiety medication that I had been prescribed for over 12 years. And I needed something more holistic that could consistently manage my symptoms without medicine. And so that actually brought me to the book Breathe and studying under Dr. Belisa Vranich probably around 2018, let's call it. And so I was intrigued by Dr. Belisa because she had an interesting story where she was suffering from panic attacks. And one such attack actually happened while she was rollerblading alongside the New York highway and pulverizing her teeth at night because of stress. Dr. Belisa is a clinical psychologist and an author and a former sex expert, if we're going to get real personal. And she dove into the world of breath work and science, studying things like martial arts, breathing in birthing, um, singing, yoga, a number of different modalities. And then she distilled all of what she learned in her research into the breathe method that we're going to discuss a little bit today. Next slide, please. So, what are we actually going to go over? We're definitely going to move our bodies. You're going to learn some actionable strategies. But predominantly, one of the uh, main things I want you guys to take away today is that in order for us to effectively change, considering the psychology of breathing, we really need to understand what's going on in our body, when and how things started to change, and what we can do to move beyond these existing patterns. So we're going to talk about how to identify our current breathing patterns, the 
deleterious effects of breathing poorly. Uh, as I mentioned, the biomechanics and psychology of breathing, and then just how to correct breathing dysfunction so that we can reduce our anxiety, thrive in the workplace, and live better, more comfortable lives. Next slide, please. So let's get right into it. We're going to check our breathing. I'm not sure what's going on with my slide. There's a little bit of a funny thing at the top. So if you guys are missing some of the text at the top, I apologize. So you're going to take your hands. It doesn't matter which order, but you're going to place one hand on your chest. And then I want you to place one hand on your belly. I'm sorry, you can't see my belly today, but I promise I still have one. And then I just want you to take a few breaths normally, not really thinking about anything. Just follow your own pace and tune in to what parts of your body are moving or not moving. So we're going to get quiet for just a minute, and I want you to tune into that breath. Pay attention to which parts of your hand are moving. Let's go. Couple more. All right, so hopefully that was enough time for you to get comfy, get those hands on your chest and belly and tune in to what you're feeling. So let's move to the next slide and kind of talk about what you might have experienced. So if the top of your chest was moving and your hand at the top was kind of moving up and down or back and forth, but the hand that was on your belly didn't move at all, then I'm sorry to report that currently you're a vertical breather, but there, one of our guests is not getting any audio. Um, Trisha, I would encourage you to maybe drop out of the meeting and tune back in and see if we can get you synced back up. Does everybody else have sound? Awesome. Cool. So if you found that you are currently a vertical breather, that is completely normal. Unfortunately, a lot of us are breathing this way these days. When Dr. Belisa did her research for the book Breathe, they actually found that 10 out of nine out of 10 of their participants were currently breathing in some dysfunctional way. So it's pretty common these days, but the good news is we were designed to breathe. We have all of the uh, equipment, if you will, that we need in order to fix these patterns. Patterns, and I'm here to share a handful of strategies that will help you kind of switch back to what we are meant to be doing. If you found that a little bit of your hand on your chest and a little bit of your hand on your belly was moving, then you're currently a mixed breather, which means that you probably vacillate between dysfunctional breathing patterns and healthy breath patterns. And it's going to be a little bit easier for you to change and go all the way back to a beautiful biomechanically sound horizontal breath. And so that's what if you were a person who didn't have any movement going on in your chest and just the hand on your belly moved around, then thankfully you can sign right off Zoom because you're already a horizontal breather. And the strategies I'm going to share today are maybe only partially supportive to your journey. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. So we're going to briefly go over Dr. Belisa's breathe method. Today's presentation is really more targeted about how we can more easily live less anxiously and those actionable strategies. But if anybody chooses to read the book Breathe or invests in a breathing class uh, or, or works one-on-one -on -one with me in the future, the Breathe method is all about taking your breath back to horizontal as we talked. So using a biomechanically sound breath with the diaphragm versus our extraneous muscles in our neck and shoulders. The breathe method also tracks progress. So we always go through functional measurements. When you begin the breathe method, you're going to be given a grade, which we call the breathing IQ or BIC. And at the end of the presentation, I'll show you a website where you can actually measure your breathing IQ for the first time. If you want to begin in uh, keeping tabs on your breathing progress. And 
we also consider endurance baselines. So how, how long can you run without getting gassed these days? How many push-ups can you do? Uh, how long can you hold your breath? Although we're not going to talk a lot about breath holding today, but certain endurance baselines that you can measure real actionable strategies that you get a beginning and an end result. And you can see how quickly am I improving over time? And then the breathe method really is not your besties breath work session. It's kind of like a yoga class on steroids. It's somewhere between moving your body and lifting weights because you're actually focused on moving your breathing muscles. We have 10 pounds of breathing muscles and because they do not often get touted, most of us are not consistently training them. And they're not something that gets trained because of regular physical activity. In order to uh, improve our muscles, we have to specifically isolate them. And so breath training helps strengthen the breathing muscles around the diaphragm so that we can live more uh, biomechanically sound, if you will. And then the breathe method also focuses with everything that is intense. There's effort. Your eyes are open, not closed. We will close our eyes a little bit later when we're starting to kind of tune in and relax. But predominantly, if you are going to breath train and you want to strengthen your breathing muscles, awesome. Trisha's back. She's got sound. We love that then you do want to stay present in the moment and focused on that mind muscle connection. So let's move on to the next slide, please. We are mostly going to talk about the vertical breath for just a few minutes and why it is really deleterious to our health. So the cons of vertical breathing are Vast, And you guys may already recognize some of the things that you might be consistently experiencing and thinking that they have nothing to do with your breath patterns. But I'm sorry to report that because breathing is such a foundation of our health, it can be the catalyst for a lot of these lifestyle conditions. And that's for good reason, right? Because when we're vertical breathing, we're using our neck and shoulders and the extra muscles at the top of our our body instead of our diaphragm down in the middle of our body, and we are completely missing the diaphragm. And so as a consequence, we're going to talk a little bit about the vagus nerve in a little while. Vertical breathing makes sure that we are stuck in a sympathetic state. So as we were talking about, we might have sore neck and shoulders, you might have a sore back, definitely anxiety. You may be experiencing things like acid reflux, uh, high blood pressure, sometimes sleep issues, even poor balance because your body has been designed in uh, you know, a very strong set of muscles in the middle of our core. And if we're not utilizing our core, then we're immediately off balance. You may also find that you become too acidic or too alkaline in your blood pH. And we're going to talk about the specific secondary breathing conditions that make that the result. Next slide, please. So do you guys relate to any of these specific conditions? Because today's conversation is uh, largely about workplace thriving. You may notice this uh, next couple slides are really present when you are at work. And you may even be doing better when you're not at work. So this is an even more important conversation for us to be focused on so that when you are at work, you are keeping in mind uh, that your breath is really, really important to tune into frequently. Next slide, please. So the breath holders, this is one of the most common issues in corporate America, if you will. Most of us are sitting predominantly during the day. We get hyper-focused and it's not uncommon for someone who is accidentally a breath holder to forget to breathe. It's true. It happens frequently. And it's sometimes referred to as email apnea. You guys know it. You get the email that has lots of details, or maybe it's something that you really need to tune into. Maybe you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable about the message that you're reading, or you're just trying to crank out as much work as you need to, and you are hyper-focused. Breath holders have really tough times moving forward. 
until they actually start paying attention to their breath. So keep in mind, if you're a breath holder, we can fix this with some pretty easy strategies. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, please. If you're not a breath holder, you may resonate with being a no-hailer. No-hailers are the ones that really do not take in much air at all. It's often a stress response and it can happen from traumatic childhoods or really difficult times in life. But the consequence is that our body does become too acidic and it's because there's too much CO2 in the blood and we're stuck in that sympathetic state. If you run out of breath when you speak, which does happen occasionally, I'll find myself as a no-hailer and former paradoxical breather that I, if I have a really long sentence or like a script that I need to read verbatim, I will often not be able to get to the end of that script without running out of breath unless I've tuned into my breath prior to speaking. Next slide, please. The overbreather. So this conversation is a lot about anxiety. And so the overbreathers are feeling anxious. They breathe too fast. You might even feel like you're hyperventilating. And this is definitely related to vertical breathing. You've seen it, I'm sure. People are actually heaving their chest up and down. And that unfortunately is the consequence of being too anxious and not having a strategy that you can downregulate yourself. And the terrible consequence of overbreathing is there's too little CO2 in your blood and your body will become too alkaline as a consequence. And as we've mentioned in the prior two slides, you're definitely stuck in that sympathetic state where we do not want to be. You're missing your diaphragm. You're probably off balance and you feel like crap. Next slide, please. So the paradoxical breather, I saved the best for last because I am a former paradoxical breather. And I'm hoping that there's not very many people in the audience that are experiencing this because I'm sad to report, it's really difficult to fix. It's not impossible, but some of the strategies that I'm going to describe to you today that may be more easy to implement for someone who is a mixed breather or maybe currently a temporary Underbreather, overbreather, paradoxical breathers are really going to have a lot of struggles. So they gasp. Um, they're bracing and guarding themselves. It's often a response from childhood or if there was an injury to your middle, they breathe backwards, which means rather than leveraging their diaphragm to expand on their inhale and narrow on their exhale, they actually narrow on their inhale and they expand on their exhale. So they get tinier when they're trying to take in their air and they get larger when they are breathing out their air. You'll notice that I'm not going to use the words breathe in and breathe out as often as I use the words inhale and exhale. And that's for good reason, because we need to understand that the biomechanics of our breath are basically the opposite of the common language that we use. If we're breathing in, sure, that's true. There, the air is coming into our lungs and the air is expiring out of our lungs, but those terms can be very confusing for those of us who are not quite where we need to be efficiently. And so, as I mentioned, paradoxical breathers can really have a frustrating time because at a certain point, intellectually, you're going to have a very clear understanding of how to fix your breathing, but your body has been checked out for a while physically, and it's going to have a little bit harder of a time catching up with you. But I'm proud to report that with consistency, practice, and a little thing we like to call air packing, which we'll talk about a little bit later, you can eventually reverse that pattern and you'll be breathing biomechanically sound again. Next slide, please. So who's in charge here? Well, it's the vagus nerve. It's the 10th cranial nerve. It's the longest cranial nerve in the body. And we'll move on to the next slide to talk a little bit more about what the vagus nerve does. So it's called the wanderer nerve. Wanderer, vagus means wanderer in Latin. And it begins at the back of the head and travels throughout most major organs. And it's really meant to pick up signals that 
from your organs that will tell your brain how you need to feel. It controls our parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest and digest, and it will keep us out of chronic fight or flight because vertical breathing will tell us to be more alert if we're not triggering that vagus nerve by the movement of our diaphragm, we will automatically stick in fight or flight. You will never be able to find yourself in rest and digest, or it'll be very infrequently, like when you're laying down or sleeping. <laughs> Next slide, please. So when does our breath change and why does that happen? And it's really unfortunate because it happens pretty early. And I don't know if any of you have toddlers, but kiddos are typically still breathing diaphragmatically, biomechanically sound. So you'll notice that a toddler tummy is big and wide and they're joyful and healthy. But when we begin school, usually around the age of five and a half, our breath breathing begins to shift. So let's go to the next slide and talk about some of the reasons why that happens. So all of a sudden we've gone from wild toddlers running around all the time to being in school and sitting a whole lot. We're starting to develop friendships or struggling to make connections with people. We often begin exams and so does anxiety. You'll go to the doctor and maybe they'll you know, place their stethoscope at the top of your chest and tell you, give me a big deep breath. And so we think, that must be where my lungs are, right? And unfortunately, we are using a little bit of our lungs and missing the majority of our lungs, which do begin up at the collarbone, but they stretch all the way down to the bottom of our rib cage, their spongy tissue. And if we are only using the top of our chest to breathe, we're missing out on the most dense oxygen rich part of our lungs. Maybe you get teased when you begin school or you are simply starting to be around adults and most adults, unless they've gone to this presentation, are going to be breathing pretty terribly. And then the sad consequence is if you are a person who doesn't actually shift your breathing to negative breathing patterns, well, our breathing naturally starts to decline at age 29. So maybe that's another reason why I was compelled to take out the medication and start diving into breathing because this is kind of when my breathwork journey started. Next slide, please. You may also experience emotional or physical corsets that um, affect the way you're breathing. That can happen through emotional or physical trauma. If you've ever had an injury in the middle of your body, that um, healing time where you don't even have the choice to breathe in your middle, that can require you to develop new patterns. And once you do something for a period of time, we all know how easy it is to make even bad habits stick. And so that can occur. We also may be experiencing some unsafe environment if you're bracing or guarding. I know that I grew up in a home of two wonderful parents, but they were each struggling with addiction issues. And it became kind of my way of coping. So I would guard my body as I still kind of sleep like that you know, with my shoulders turned in. And then a physical corset can actually be built when you are a fitness bunny. If you are really well-developed, you have an amazing physique and lots of ab muscles, unfortunately, that may become a rib cage where the expansion of your ribs is compromised by that beautiful muscle that you've built. So at the bottom, we'll talk a little bit of factor fiction. So I know for decades, I thought that when we hold our middle together, you know, get that snatched cute waist, bracing our middle will make our abs stronger. I figured I'm, I'm activating my muscles. Of course, that's going to be doing uh, wonders for my physique. But the sad news is just with any other muscle, in order for it to strengthen, we do have to take them through a range of motion. So a static hold on something is not going to be as effective as taking it through a range of motion that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Next slide, please. Yay, finally. So the pros of horizontal breathing, basically it's the opposite of everything that we just talked about. 
you want to be in a parasympathetic state. So you're in rest and digest instead of fight, flight, or freeze. Horizontal breathing will allow you to have immediate mental clarity, headspace. That's why they named an app that. You'll have better digestion, lower blood pressure, improved sleep, and you will be able to manage your anxiety without medication. Although I want you to know that anxiety cannot be fully banished because if we want all of our systems to work correctly, we do still want the ability to become vigilant when necessary. Um, but hopefully the anxiety is not going to be a daily practice, just you know, part of your mundane life, being in traffic, getting frustrated. Anxiety will be reserved for when things and problems come up that really need solved or when excitement uh, of whatever is happening next is appropriate. So we don't want to banish anxiety entirely. We just want to stop feeling anxious for no reason. Next slide, please. So the diaphragm, as we have kind of touched on, we've teased it a little bit, is the one in charge of making this happen. If you are tired of deleterious health and you have identified yourself as a vertical breather or even a mixed breather, then listen up. The diaphragm is in the middle of our body. It's often depicted on um, charts as just a tiny little red line, but you can see my cute logo at the very top. It's actually a muscle that is shaped similar to that. I've even brought a little example. Bear with me. I've never cooked broccoli in this, but you can see that the example of this little strainer, it's the closest thing that I could come up with where the diaphragm moves similarly. So as we Inhale, our body expands, the diaphragm pushes our ribs out so that we can fill up our lungs. And then as we exhale, your diaphragm is gonna narrow, squeeze, and the body is gonna narrow. It's the size of a Frisbee, stretches all the way around our middle. It's about the thickness of a skirt steak, it's found right under your heart and right above your digestive organs and it does support peristalsis. So that's the wave-like motion of the intestines. If you're struggling with digestion in either direction, look no further because you may be able to improve some of your symptoms simply by focusing on your breath. Next slide, please. So as we kind of talked about with my little demo of my broccoli strainer, the diaphragm works just as we mentioned. On your inhale, it flattens and pushes the rib cage open. On the exhale, it narrows. Our ribs are attached to our sternum like handles on a pail. And so when the diaphragm is activated correctly, the ribs are able to splay open to let all of that wonderful air in to not only the tiny top of our lungs, but the largest, most oxygen rich, densest part of our lungs toward the bottom. And then if you didn't know, now you do. The diaphragm can turn amnestic. So the diaphragm is, like I mentioned, we've got about 10 pounds of breathing muscles supporting it. It's a muscle in and of itself. It's the thoracic diaphragm, and if you don't use it, you lose it. So if you're a person similar to me who has had terrible breathing patterns for much longer than they were even aware of, it's a possibility that your diaphragm does not move. And the good news is we can correct that. It's actually interesting. The very first client that I ever worked with had had her diaphragm lock up, unfortunately, as a consequence of long COVID. And it was during one of our second or third meetups where we were going through a range of motion called cat cow, which is similar to the yoga pose, but more focused on the breathing aspect her diaphragm actually released. It was really cool, was such a great testimonial that the mind-muscle connection can help us begin to change those patterns and it just takes time and dedication. Next slide, please. So the diaphragm and the pelvic floor are besties. They are both actually diaphragms. Um, and they need to move in sync with one another in order to function properly. 
Contrary to popular belief, when lots of people have pelvic floor dysfunction, it's because their pelvic floor is actually too tight, not the opposite. So think about it in this way. When your diaphragm is moving out as you inhale and your body is expanding, your pelvic floor should also be relaxing. And then when you are exhaling and your body is narrowing, your pelvic floor should be given a little bit of a squeeze. So glutes and pelvic floor are relaxed when you inhale and glutes and pelvic floor, little squeeze when you exhale, your body narrows. So just keep that in mind. Um, sometimes people will refer to a Kegel in pelvic floor therapy. Kegels are really only important to do if you are also following your breath. Otherwise, if you're just arbitrarily doing a Kegel, you may be increasing the dysfunction of all of your parts. And interestingly enough, the pelvic floor, similar to the diaphragm and our breathing muscles where there's 10 pounds of muscles, the pelvic floor has between 18 and 20 different little muscles, depending on whether you're male or female. They're all important. I definitely can't name them because I'm not an anatomy expert, but there's a lot of things going on down there. So do yourself a favor and start to learn how to link your breathing with your pelvic floor health. Again, pelvic floor and glutes stay relaxed when you are inhaling and expanding and your pelvic floor and glutes tighten just a little bit when you exhale narrow and squeeze. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk about an introductory breath. Eventually, if you're not breathing dysfunctionally, dysfunctionally at all, you're going to have this beautiful diaphragmatic circumferential breath, which means that all parts of your middle, your sides and your back expand at once. And you don't have this exaggerated belly when you're breathing. It is a little bit too early for us to jump right into the circumferential breath. So let's just get started with a belly breath. You're probably already familiar, but we're going to expand as we inhale by placing our hands on the bottom part of our ribs. I want you to actually, for just a moment, walk your fingers around. I know you can't see what I'm doing. The bottom of your ribs, keep going all the way to the back, you may notice that at the back of your ribs, you might have some sensitivity that is probably because of an underused diaphragm and or you're starting to tap back into it and your muscles are a little bit sore because they're getting worked out as a consequence. So walk your hands all the way back to the front again and then rest them comfortably just at the bottom of your rib cage, your fingers may gently be near your belly button or just below. And then when you are ready, I want you to think only about expanding your belly. So inhale, expand, push your belly out. If you're really thin, let your belly go if you're like the rest of us. And when you're ready to narrow your breath, exhale, you're going to squeeze, scoop the belly in, hollow out. Do it one more time. Inhale, expand, let that belly go or push it into your hands. Exhale, squeeze, narrow, hollow out. I hope that makes sense. Let's do it one more time. Inhale, let the belly go. Exhale, narrow and squeeze. So you'll notice that I may be doing my breath work with either my nose or my mouth. If you're a person who is currently predominantly a vertical breather, I'm actually going to encourage you that temporarily, if you are specifically trying to switch back to being a horizontal breather, use your mouth, get a visual cue and a an auditory cue of your breath, because that's going to help your mind and body start to sync up together. When you're feeling more confident, you're welcome to use your nose because there are some additional benefits of, you know, heating the breath, the nitric oxide 
But if you are really just as a beginner, like I was a few years ago, use your mouth when you're practicing some of these breathing exercises until you're feeling super confident and you have a great expanded inhale and a skinny, narrow exhale, blowing all of your air out. Next slide, please. So we've talked about this for a little while. Our bodies were meant to breathe this way. Your body will remember. It was designed to be this way. But sometimes we will forget. So I'd like to move on to the next slide and get a little bit deeper into things. I don't know what's going on with these slides. They really switched around when we converted them. I'm sorry, guys. So this next exercise is an add-on to the belly breath. It's called rock and roll. I think you can do it most anywhere. It's one of my favorites, but if you are driving, I would suggest that you do not do it. If you, I want you to be in a seated environment, comfy in cross-legged or stacked your legs or sitting in a chair. Otherwise you could feel a little flighty. I mean, you're welcome for it, but uh, just let's keep it safe. So the rock and roll breath is the add-on to the belly breath, and it is designed to give your body and mind something to do so that you run out of other things that you can think about. So you're utilizing your physical movement to tap in to that breath. So on your inhale, you're going to tip your tailbone out, kick your hips forward, kind of your butt might feel like a selfie butt. You're about to take really, really cute picture, Just tip it out. So on your inhale, you're going to expand hips, rock forward. And then on your exhale, you're going to roll your hips under. Kind of like you're slumped on the couch, exhale, narrow, and squeeze. And then you're just going to repeat that for as many times as you feel like it on a rock and roll. So inhale, rock forward, belly expands, cute selfie butt, exhale, narrow, and squeeze. Let's do one more. Inhale, rock forward tailbone tips out, selfie butt, exhale, roll under, slumped on the couch, watching a movie, narrow and squeeze. I do want you to keep a couple of things in mind. As you go along, you may find that either on your inhale or your exhale that you are running out of breath but I want you to know that most of us only use about 40% of our actual vital lung capacity. And so if you want to start testing yourself to improve your ability to inhale longer or exhale longer, I want to introduce the idea of air packing. So when you feel like you can't inhale any more air, you're just going to take another sip. And you can do the same on your exhale where you feel like you can't exhale any further, but you're just gonna keep trying to blow out and tightening your core belly button to spine a couple more times. So And you can do that with your nose or your mouth, but I was kind of exaggerating it with my little who face so that maybe you can hear over the mic the difference between the air getting inhaled and exhaled. I'll have you switch to the next slide because this one's really ugly. So here's what you guys have been waiting for. We're going to talk about real strategies that will help you live less anxiously in the moment if you need to upregulate or downregulate yourself. So lots of people in the breathwork space teach lots of diverse breathing patterns. But I don't know about you guys, but I have had enough with 
extra information. I am looking for the most simple routines, things I can remember and easily implement on a daily basis. So you are not going to hear me talking about extremely complex, different breath patterns, because the gist of it is that while breath counts can be impactful, and there's plenty of practitioners that teach tons and tons of diverse strategies, they don't truly matter because breath counts give the mind something to focus on so that the body can pick up the signals that are led by your breath. The two most important things that you need to be aware of when you're taking this into consideration is that if your inhale is longer, so when you are expanding and breathing that air, you can spend longer doing that to make yourself alert. So think about the person who is anxious. They are breathing more frequently, so their inhales are probably longer. On the opposite end, if you want to calm yourself down, you want to focus on your exhale. The exhales need to be longer comparative to your inhales following one or the other is going to be supportive based on what you are trying to achieve. So inhales that are longer will make you more alert. Exhales that are longer are going to make you feel more calm. So for the anxious person, you're going to want to be focused on your exhale to make yourself you know, get into the zone. I'll have you move to the next slide, please. So we've touched on this a little bit, but let your breath lead your heart. So the heart is going to slow down when air is exhaled more slowly than it is inhaled. If you do the opposite pattern, your heart is going to speed up. So for today's conversation, those of you who are feeling anxious when you are in that mode, focus on increasing the length of your exhale comparative to your inhale. And if you need to amp yourself up, which I don't recommend it, it's pretty easy for us to get amped up if we need it. But, um, you know, you can breathe more quickly on your inhale and then short, more shorter exhales, if that makes sense. So we're going to do another example of kind of how to do this as quickly as possible. So I know you guys are looking for actionable strategies that you can dump into your regular workplace. And I think I have just the solution. Next slide, please. It's the physiological sigh. You guys might have heard about it before. It's been popularized more frequently with a few well-known people in the media, and it truly is the fastest way to calm down. And so it's going to be two short, fast inhales followed by a comparatively longer exhale. And it looks kind of like this. Or... You'll even notice that if you are upset and you've been crying, that your body will naturally put you into physiological sigh. I know that I've caught myself in uh, a moment where I was really, really upset and the body will just kick you into it. So it's kind of amazing. We are really brilliantly designed. But if your body is not doing you a favor in the moment, tap into the physiological sigh, it can really help very, very quickly. So we'll do it one more time if anybody wants to do it with me. Two short, fast inhales followed by a longer exhale. Ready, let's go. One more. Next slide, please. So because breath work is meant to be a very accessible practice, you'll hear that lots of people that are encouraging the benefits of conscious breathing will suggest that you take time to do this every single day, even if it's just for a few minutes. Some people even ask, how do I incorporate this into my regular workout? And there's two things I want you to consider if you are doing physical activity frequently. Tack on some regular breathing practice at the very end of your workout 
to quickly get you back into that parasympathetic state. And during your workout, if you're trying to figure out your proper breathing pattern, you want to exhale on effort, whatever physical activity that looks like for you. But the, the hard part of your movement, that's when your body should be narrowing and squeezing. And when you are doing the more passive part of your exercise, that's when you want to focus on your inhale. So we hear a lot of people um, curious about that. That's probably the best strategy. It's not going to work for everybody. And at the end of the day, if you can predominantly be breathing well for most of the time and you breathe a little bit differently for that you know 30 to hour that you're spending when you're doing physical activity that's not as important as all of the other hours that you're spending living your regular life so I want to show you another quick strategy that I learned from retired Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann. He was a former Green Beret. He is also Breathe certified, and he runs an executive coaching firm in Tampa called Rooftop Leadership. And he does this little exercise that focuses on three words and three sets of inhales and exhales at whatever length is appropriate for you. It's really meant to be personalized and something that you can access frequently. So you're going to do your inhale and exhale and then exclaim I, inhale, exhale, have, inhale, exhale, time. So I'll show you kind of what it looks like for me. But again, the tempo is going to be personalized to you. So do whatever is appropriate for you in the moment. For me, it looks like this. I... have time. I have time. I have time every day. Next slide, please. So that was the main part of what I wanted to go over with you all today. I don't know where we're doing with time. I feel like we probably have maybe 15 minutes left and I'd love to answer questions. If we have some time, if anybody has a question, I'd love to, to dive in more if there's specifics, if I went through any of the strategies too quickly, uh, I can even do a recap if there are not any specific questions. So feel free to leave anything into the chat. I'm going to be quiet for maybe a minute or so, and then I'll do a recap of our most important takeaways. All right, so no questions yet. Cool. So I'm hoping that means everything was quite clear. We'll do a recap. So Heather says that her chest feels uneven based on her lower half and can be tight very near to the end of the inhale. So what I would suggest for somebody who is feeling locked up, focus on that air packing strategy we were talking about. So since you're already breathing pretty well, you will have the time and space to continue to expand. There may even be other breathing strategies that are gonna be more helpful for someone who's already breathing horizontally. So that could mean that maybe something like your side breath is being constricted a little bit, like you have tight intercostal muscles. So one of the strategies we can do to, you know, expand a little bit more on our sides is take your arm. Well, I'm going to take the other arm up over your head, put your hand, kind of wrap it towards your ear. And then on the opposite side of where your arm is raised, bend to the side as you inhale. 
And then exhale as you come back to center. Bend one more time. Exhale, come back to center. You'll notice that you will over time start to stretch out your intercostal muscles a little bit. And then you always want to measure and match your breath on either side. Just like if you're doing a yoga class or you're lifting weights, we never want to yeah, she said, I felt something there. Awesome. That's a great strategy for you. So we'll do the other side. Arm up overhead, hand wrapped over ear, bend to the opposite side. Inhale, expand, exhale, narrow. We'll do it a second time. Inhale, expand, exhale, narrow and squeeze. And just these are little tiny muscles. So these are little movements. You may feel like you could do a ton of these, but go slow if these are the first uh, breath, breath work exercises that you've ever tried out because we are moving muscles that are underutilized often. You might feel some pinching or some fatigue. If you've really gone hard with the couple of strategies that we've talked about today, you might even find that your core is a little bit sore tomorrow, like you've worked out. It's totally normal. It's just because we're moving around in ways that we don't usually um, move. So maybe Epsom salt bath, get yourself a nice hot tea later, stretch it out on the floor. And speaking of being on the floor, so the things that we talked about today are the strategies that I would use if I'm in the workplace and I really need to downregulate quickly. But it's as we kind of talked about when we were discussing when we're kind of moving into our negative breathing patterns as kiddos. It's because we're sitting down for the first time frequently. Sitting actually affects our breathing. So you'll notice that if you are standing up or lying down, you're going to naturally have an easier time regulating your breath and going back to being a horizontal breather. So if you're a person that is a vertical breather at the moment and you're struggling with some of these exercises as we're sitting up doing rock and roll breath, I'm going to actually suggest that when you have time, lay down in a comfy spot, place something that is weighted like a, a pound or two or or you can go heavy once you're feeling really froggy but place something that is weighted over your belly button toward the bottom of your ribs while you are lying flat and then I want you to practice your belly breath we call these diaphragm extensions where you're going to focus on raising the item that's on your belly up to the sky on your inhale as much as you can and then as you exhale you're going to focus on narrowing and squeezing squeezing, taking that item that's on your belly, belly button to spine, lowering it as much as you can. And you can do those as many times as you want. That's probably the easiest breathwork strategy for people to consider. It's also really good if you're sick in bed, you can kind of um, you know, move a little bit of your body. It's a nice little activity and it can help things like respiratory infections or even falling asleep more easily. So if you're working on a new certification and you're feeling particularly anxious before you go to bed, grab something, do some diaphragm extensions in bed, maybe 20, 30, 50, instead of counting sheep, and you'll find that you will be more relaxed and ready to go to sleep much more quickly. Uh, Judith asks, how do we get more info on these exercises? So what I will do is add a PDF of a handful of these exercises that I would recommend in our course shell over on Apprendo. If anybody does not receive a copy or has joined us from somewhere that is not Apprendo, you can email me at ceucenter at thequalified.com and I will make sure that you get a copy. And so I think we have a few more minutes. Cool, Heather was about to ask. So before we sign off, just rapid fire one more time, 
fastest way is going to be your physiological sigh. If you're not able to do a physiological sigh, simply focus on increasing the length of your exhale comparative to your inhale. If you are a very thin person, you may notice that you have more trouble with your inhales because there's nowhere in your body to properly expand. And if you are like the rest of us, you may struggle with your exhales because um, there's more going on in our body and it's harder to narrow and squeeze. So I want to thank you all for your time today. I hope that some of these strategies were valuable. I look forward to sharing a handful of these exercises in our course shell. And if you need anything, you can find me at CEU Center at thequalified.com. I love supporting you. I love breathing in my own time. And I think we make a lot of choices in life. And if it can be focused on living better and consciously breathing, the world would be a better place. Heather also asks, how do we receive our CEUs? So in the Apprendo platform, after you complete our required event experience survey, the certificate should get unlocked for you. If anything does not um, occur the way we expect it to, once you watch the Zoom and complete the required event experience form, again, please go ahead and email me at ceucenter at the qualifiedcom So Judith also asks, how often can you do the physiological sigh? So because it's so quick and easy, I think that you could do it as frequently as you feel that you need it. Again, you just want to focus on the exhale being longer relative to your inhale. And you can do this loudly, auditorily, or uh, through your nose. It's actually one of the strategies that I suggest to students that are getting nervous when they're ready to take an exam because you can kind of get away with a little <sighs> without anyone noticing. And then the last strategy I'll leave you guys with before we hang up is if you are feeling particularly anxious, instead of trying to take a big deep breath, go ahead and exhale your air out first. Wring your body out like a sponge and you're making space for those good deep breaths next. It's been a pleasure, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for attending. Bye. This has been absolutely wonderful, Julia. Thank you so much for being with us today and sharing this. This has been fresh information, very refreshing, very open, airy information. I absolutely love today's session because this is something that's, we, that we don't get often uh, working in the HIM profession. We don't often see uh, or have presentations that target our physical and mental health like this. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Everyone, thank you for being with us today. We do want to let you know a little bit more about the Qualified. We hope that you would stay connected with us on the social media platforms. Uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube are available platforms that you can find us at. And then we have a QR code on the screen. So you could, you could scan this now so that you can connect easily with the Qualified. We also have our website posted here. You can find more information about the services that we offer at the-qualified.com. All right. So join us, please, everyone, next month. Next month, May 16th at 11 a.m. We hope that you will join us for our next Brunch and Learn. We offer these services every single month on the third Thursday. And if you are ever interested in presenting some unique or um, industry-specific information, then email me at events at thequalified.com and I'll be sure to respond to you. Everyone, that's all we have for now. We want you to continue breathing healthily and apply these principles that Julia taught us today. Again, Julia, thank you so much for presenting and sharing your expertise and your knowledge with us. Thank you to all of those who are joining us on various platforms. We hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. See you in the chat next month.